Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly leadership podcast called On Leadership with Scott Miller. I'm your host each week and today we've got a great guest that is rounding out our entire interview series. Mindy Henderson comes back for the second time. Before I introduce her formally, you may know that recently I wrote a book about the podcast called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds for Franklin Covey, published by HarperCollins, where I curated 30 of my favorite, most impactful interviews from the first couple years with the permission of those guests. Wrote a book about each of them, light, easy, and breezy, kind of call it uh, chicken soup for the soul. Pick up a copy on Amazon or wherever you buy books. And now coming out October 4th is Master Mentors Volume 2 in the same series by HarperCollins, again, based on this podcast, now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, both in audio and video formats, where I've interviewed interviewed and identified 30 new mentors with 30 new transformative insights on sale October 4th, available now for pre-order. And I've just started Master Mentors Volume 3. Perhaps um, our guest, I believe, might even have already agreed to be in Master Mentors series. But Mindy Henderson is the author of the uh, just recently released book, The Truth About Things That Suck. I love the tagline. Uh, And How to Make Them Suck Less. Mindy Henderson, welcome to On Leadership. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Hey, great to have you back. You appeared several dozen interviews ago when I struck up a friendship with you some of, from a variety of social media contacts and networks. We became fast friends, and I realized that there was a lot to learn from you. Um, oh. a, a, socially, emotionally, intellectually, but also physically in terms of some limitations that you have. We spent the better part of 45 minutes talking, teaching me and millions now of viewers and listeners around how does uh, someone that has a disability, that has perhaps some physical restrictions that you have, how do we refer to you? How do we speak to you in a respectful manner? How do we build a workplace culture, physically and culturally, that accommodates you well? Mindy, before we talk about the new book, The Truth About Things That Suck, would you take a minute and reorient our listeners and viewers to your journey? Maybe perhaps less your professional career, although that's robust. Um, What has been your physical challenge, your health, your diagnosis, and, and maybe recap some of the insights that we shared on our previous podcast around how people with, with disabilities want to be treated in every aspect of life. Yeah, it's a big question. I was, just to start at the very beginning, I was diagnosed with a condition called spinal muscular atrophy when I was about 15 months old, which uh, means that I've been tethered to a wheelchair for the better part of my life. Um, I've lived my life from a wheelchair. And with that has come, you know, a lot of daily challenges and inconveniences and and things. Um, In addition to that, I've faced a number of other challenges, a lot of challenges that I think all of us face, things like job loss and um, and some some really terrible car crashes that I'm sorry to say I've been party to. And I've I've over the course of my life just really had some amazing opportunities to learn how to navigate adversity well and to develop sort of a perspective on how we face the challenges in our lives that really led me to write this book. And just to hearken back to our earlier podcast conversation, you know, I really appreciated the opportunity to come on and talk about sort of social conscience where it relates to disability. I think the community of individuals with disabilities remains one of the most underrepresented um, groups of people in our country, and I'm always happy to get the chance to speak about it. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, this is your first uh, official book. You also host a podcast by the same name. If my memory serves correct, you are twice the, quote, poster child for muscular dystrophy. You're also an ambassador for that very fine nonprofit and, and organization as well. Um, What I'd like to do now is talk about some of the lessons that you've written about in your book. And I want to open with actually a phone call, actually a text that I got this morning from my mother. Um, I'm an early riser, uh, 4 a.m. every day, seven days a week. My mother lives in Orlando, Florida, where I'm from. So it was 6 a.m. her time. But she's kind of a typical 80-year-old, right? She gets up at 4 in the morning, goes to bed at 4 in the afternoon. So I woke up to a text from my mother this morning. My mother is 80, still married to my father, 59 years, living in the same house that they were married in, you know, a boondoggle of years ago. And the text basically says, um, 
My cousin Louise passed away yesterday. I'm very sad. It's my last living blood relative. This oh. is a distant aunt of mine. And when I read the text, my first thought was, well, I'm a blood relative, and so is my brother, so that's not exactly true, Mom. But, you know, welcome to being Scott Miller. And then I thought, <laughs> oh, you know what? I should call my mom, which I don't do regularly, not enough. I don't do it, ir- I do it irregular, but different podcast, different confession. I call my mother, and this is a, a, Aunt R is in her mid-90s. Her passing was, you know, long overdue in terms of her suffering and health, and in many ways it was a blessing. And I got on the phone with my mother, who's not a very emotional person by nature, and she started crying, and she was very sad. And I immediately find myself, found myself talking her out of it. Well, wasn't this really a blessing, Mom? And I really found immediately me doing what you talk about in the book, which is how many of us push the bright side. And it's kind of an opening concept in your book. I found myself this morning, having just finished your book yesterday, faced this morning with a, you know, an otherwise very sad experience for my mother. Initially, I started to kind of spin it and posture it. And, well, she was 93, Mom, and she'd been so sick. And was it? And I thought, you know what? I'm doing what Mindy says, be cognizant of. I'm pushing the bright side. So I found, my, found myself kind of rewinding a little bit and validating my mom. Mom, that is sad. Mom, you should take some time to, you know, grieve. And then she went on on a... On a appropriate 80-year-old diatribe around how important grieving was. I kind of let her talk and talk and talk and talk, and I'm not a very patient person. But the fact (laughs) is, is that just by reading your book, I found myself pushing the bright side. I'd like you to riff on that. You're not a psychiatrist, you're not a psychologist, but you're a a very accomplished mother and spouse and podcaster and now author and spokesperson. Why don't we push the bright side, and what's the downside of that? You know, I, I think the downside of that is not appreciating or giving yourself a minute to actually feel and process the emotions that come along with hard things. And it's been a lesson that I've had to learn in life. You know, being a motivational speaker, I found at one point in my life that I, I, I became that person who really jumped straight to the motivational speaking and, and to trying, trying to get people to see the bright side first thing when something went wrong or when they experienced a trauma. And I had the opportunity to interview a gentleman who I know you had on your podcast, Sean Aker, who I would argue as the best job on the planet. He's a happiness researcher. And he, when I interviewed him for the book, he reminded me that sometimes it's okay to not be okay. And that we need to sit with our, our feelings and our emotions, because just like the book says in the, in the title, the very first truth about adversity and the challenges that we face in life is that they suck. And so I think to dismiss that and to jump straight to trying to find the bright side and look for the lessons and things, you know, you you do yourself a disservice by not letting yourself just sort of grieve and feel what you need to feel. Mindy, I think it's a profound point. I was privileged to receive a, a digital copy of your book months ago, so I've had some time mm-hmm. to digest it. And I think I've done some introspection around I always do this. I always try to find the silver lining, right? When one door closes, another opens. Sometimes a disappointment turns into an appointment. And I have all kinds of cliches or adages that I've taken from other people. And I don't know why that's the case. I always try to clean things up. And I think it's probably because, like many people, I'm a pragmatist. I'm a realist. I live in reality. I don't read fiction. I don't, really, I don't read, read science fiction. I like to live in the brutal reality of what are the facts? What can I do about it? And how do I move forward? And I think you've given me some pause to think about, to recognize that there is value, duh, but there is value in recognizing that um, sometimes things suck and it's okay to recognize that and not always immediately move into posturing and spinning and, and moving into what's the bright side. Let yourself and let others say it's tough and I'm depressed and this is sad and this sucks. Yeah, because yeah, I I think the other point that I want to make is that 
it's not fun to sit in that space where something terrible has happened. And I think that the tendency, whether it's you that the thing is happening to or someone that you love, I think the tendency is to want to avoid that pain and that that suffering and those unpleasant emotions and feelings that come along with them. And again, like you said, I'm not a psychologist, but you know, I, I think that if if we do work through the emotions properly, as unpleasant as they might be, I think that we can more effectively find the bright side and the lessons and um, you know the hindsight that we can come away with things from. Well, if anybody in the world deserves an honorary doctorate and perseverance and resilience and understanding how to find joy in the pain, it would be you. So when I'm, the, when I'm the president of a university, I'll be conferring that on you. Uh, <laughs> Mindy, your book is excellent. It's a lovely read, very um, conversational. You write like you speak, similar to how I do. You have some great nuggets and stories. You obviously have had a life of challenge that many of us don't even remotely recognize. You share a great concept in the book where you say, you believe that bad exists to define the good. Mm -hmm. Bad exists to help us define the good. Expand on that. Yes, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I always like to take it from the standpoint of asking people to kind of, you know, imagine this utopia that I that I think can be so alluring that a lot of us, a lot of the time might want to live in where there are no problems and we all have a roof over our heads and we all have friends and family and money in the bank and and jobs that we love and are passionate about and all of those things. But I I, I feel like if that was all that existed and there was nothing bad or challenging that came along with those things, would we know how great they were? Would we be able to appreciate them the way that we do if we've struggled in other ways? And, you know, I think about it in terms of if we never saw another person suffering from a disability or a sickness, could we ever appreciate our own health and recognize how fortunate we are to be healthy people. And if we never saw a person with no home, as, as heartbreaking as that is, could we ever really appreciate the homes that we get to live in every day? And so I really do believe that without some challenges and some struggles in our lives, it would be hard to see the meaning behind any of those good things. It perhaps is sad, but piercingly true. A mutual friend of ours, of course, is Nick Vujicic. Nick's, Nick has been on our program. He's a good friend of mine, uh, the world famous Australian, now American, of course, born with no arms and no legs. Mm -hmm. And Nick is just a force of nature when it comes to mindset and positivity and gratitude. But he was the first mentor in Master Mentors Number One. And it was from several encounters with Nick at my home where I started to really, for the first time in my adult life, at the age of 50, show gratitude for my hands and my arms and my legs and being able to go use the restroom by myself in private and dress myself. In fact, these are things that even you are dependent upon other people for. You live a very independent life in certain aspects and a very dependent life in other aspects. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, you don't have the use of your legs or your hands, minimal use of your, of your fingers, correct? You are dependent upon someone else for bathing and dressing and feeding, am I correct on that? Um, I do have the use of my hands, but you're correct. I, um, I'm dependent on people in a lot of ways, bathing, dressing, getting in and out of bed, using the bathroom, like you yeah. say. Um, you know, so I, 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 I joke all the time that I'm kind of a living contradiction because I was born with these dependencies on other people. And yet I have this fiercely independent spirit. And I've worked really, really hard over the course of my life to architect a life where a life without limits, honestly, where I can live as anyone else does, work a job that I love, raise a family, do all of the things, you know, drive a car, um, do all of the things that anyone else would do. I've just had to you know, put a little bit of extra thought and effort into those things. Well, my point in sharing that, which you've been very forthright in what your 
physical limitations are. I'm guessing you would look at someone like Nick that has no arms and no legs, and it makes you immensely grateful for your hands and your fingers and your limited use. 100%. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think that no matter how big our challenges are, they could always be bigger, you know? And I I think that this is a, a great example of that. Mindy, speak to the concept in your book about the power of assigning what you say is meaning to our adversity. You clearly face a daily, hourly adversity that I don't face. Mm-hmm. But, you, but, you, but you, you've popularized this idea of how valuable it is to actually assign meaning to our adversity. Riff on that. Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've seen it happen to other people in my life. I think that if we don't you know, very intentionally look for some meaning and some purpose. I'm, I'm very careful because I don't like to say that there's a reason for everything that happens, but I think that there can be meaning and purpose when we look for it in the, the hard things that we go through. And I think that if you don't choose to look for those things, I think that it's really easy to Um, sort of succumb to things like anger and bitterness. And I've had times in my life where, um, you know, the circumstances have been so challenging that I I was starting to have those tendencies and, and move down those paths. And it took a minute for me to stop and listen to the thoughts in my head and actually hear them, these loops that play over and over in our heads and to realize that, you know, no, if I didn't find another way to look at this and if I didn't find, you know, maybe some meaning or some purpose behind it, um, I could become the worst version of myself. And I don't want to live as an angry, frustrated, jaded person. And I think that's the danger if you don't look for some good and some meaning in the things that we go through. And that takes practice, right? It takes some self-awareness. It takes for uh, sure uh, uh, reminding ourselves that not all of our thoughts are true and we shouldn't believe all of our thoughts. I, I, your, your book is, uh, is a masterpiece in terms of the content that you share. Uh, your chapters are about disability and illness, fear, failure, vanity, loneliness, overwhelm, job loss, shame, discrimination, the struggle to become a mom, rejection, comparison, exclusion, feeling lost, disappointment. I think my favorite chapter was chapter seven, problems we create for ourselves. Mm. I, I recently had the privilege of interviewing Camilla McConaughey on the podcast, Matthew McConaughey's wife and the yes. mother of three children and her own right, a very successful entrepreneur, was a, 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 a renowned fashion model. And uh, I, asked, I asked her some questions around, you know, like, what's it like to be the McConaughey's going to Applebee's? Like, do you go to <laughs> Applebee's? And she said, yeah, we go. It's easy to get in. It's harder <laughs> to get out because people want to, you know, have um, conversations. But what she said is, is, you know, when it comes to being a celebrity and raising your family in the public eye, they very deliberately do not pursue conflict. Now, they have conflict in life, and they don't avoid conflict, but they very deliberately don't pursue conflict. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of this thought in your book where you talk about this idea of conjured or manufactured fear. One more thought, and I'll let you riff on this. Coincidentally, when I interviewed Matthew McConaughey a year and a half ago on the same podcast, he I asked him, what's the smartest thing you've ever learned in life? He thought, kind of Matthew McConaughey style. Mm -hmm. And he basically, in a nutshell, I'll paraphrase it, he said, you know, he used to have a friend who I think had an uncle. The uncle said, I've had a thousand problems in life and hardly any of them ever came true. And that's haunted me in a positive way. Talk about how all of us have what you call conjured or manufactured fear. Yeah, I I think it's a completely natural part of the human existence. Um, You know, I I think I think that fear exists for a reason. And I think that that we're all in, in one way, shape or form sort of taught to anticipate fear and and things that that could happen so that we can protect ourselves against those things. But I think that we have the tendency to sort of you know, overkill that tendency a little bit. And 
um, and, and tell ourselves stories about things that might happen. You know, we, you know, if, if you're having a problem at work and, you know, maybe you have a conflict with your boss or something like that, you might start to tell yourself a big story about how you're going to lose your job and, um, and, you know, all your money and be homeless and what's going to happen to your family and all of these things. And, you know, um, I, I think that while it's natural to do it, I think it's important to try to learn to catch ourselves when we start to tell ourselves those stories, because I believe wholeheartedly in self-fulfilling prophecies. And I believe that what you look for is going to show up every time, whether it's good or bad. And, you know, I, I, I think that if, we can stop and ask ourselves if we're telling ourselves something that's true, that's happened, or something that might happen and sort of recognize that, you know, that's kind of the first step, that awareness that you talked about. And then I think hope is really the second piece of that equation, because my personal definition of hope is that the, the belief that something else is possible. And if you can get yourself into that mindset about things, I think it can be a game, game changer because everything about you then can change. The words that you choose to use, the way that you react to situations, the way that you respond to people, and all of that can sort of ooze out into the circumstances that we're making our way through. And it can, it can change the outcome of the things that we're facing and that we're afraid might happen. Mindy, in no way is your book a sob story. You certainly have had trials and adversities that I can't even relate to that is, uh, is sobering and, and humbling, right? Uh, for someone that's had a, a much easier journey than you have. In fact, you write a lot about loneliness in the book in, in, in many parts of your life, in, in, in high school, right? When you, or junior high school, one of the two, when you, you know, weren't on the in crowd and you were in the out crowd and what that looked like and when your car was, I think, out of commission for a while and you were home for an extended period of time during COVID because you have some compromised health issues and COVID could be, you know, life ending for you. Mm -hmm. If you were to catch that, you write about how one day both of your caretakers, which you are completely dependent upon because you wanted a husband, not a nurse. So you write very clearly that when you married your husband, you said, I want a husband, not a nurse. And so you worked a career and built skills. You have a master's degree to earn the income you needed to actually take care of yourself. You wrote about how on one occasion, both of your caretakers not only didn't show up, they quit. You've had, you've had a close brush with lots of loneliness. Um, what's your position on that? And for people listening today that are feeling lonely, what advice do you have? You know, for loneliness is, I, I, it's, I think it's a club that we're all members of. I, I think that, it, I don't think it matters who you are. I think all of us at some point in our lives experience loneliness for one reason or another. And so, and it's, it's, it was funny to me while, while I was writing that because the words came out that, you know, loneliness is, is a club, which, you know, you think of a club as being a social thing and, and loneliness is kind of the opposite, but knowing that it's a condition that we all suffer from at one point or another, I, I hope can give us all, first of all, some comfort around the way that we're feeling. And then, you know, I, I think that there can also be some good that we can do with the loneliness that we feel in our lives. I think loneliness, you know, if there's a point in your life when you have maybe fewer people in your life to take up your time and your thoughts and, and all of those things, I think it's a really, it can be a really good time for, for reflection and for reinvention and for learning things and, um, you know, taking your life in, in new directions and things. So I, I think that loneliness is one of those things that can be laden with opportunity if we choose to use the time productively. You know, I'll be honest, it's not an emotion that I associate with. I, I don't recall loneliness in my life. I'm sure there has been some, mm. but I'm a fairly social person and I, maybe I'm just in denial. But I really was gripped by the chapter because I actually like things that I can't identify with. 
because I feel kind ah. of insatiably interested. Tell me more about that. And maybe it's I'm just a narcissist. Probably that's true, but that's a different podcast also. <laughs> but I, I thought it was a big gift that you talked about how lonely you had been at times and how you'd worked through it. And in, in, I think you do an especially good job at catching yourself before you drown. Yeah. Whether it be around loneliness or around paranoia or around fear, you do a really good job of kind of uh, uh, pulling your head out of the water before it's too late, metaphorically. Are there any tips from your own journey that you might share with our listeners and viewers for people who are struggling with things that suck in their life and before they kind of, you know, go down the drain metaphorically and in some cases literally with people that become despondent, right? And even take their lives because uh, it's a very real problem for, yeah. for, for even for the younger generation more so. We're seeing unprecedented, you know, suicide attempts and, 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 and teens. Any advice you would give parents and listeners, otherwise people who might be feeling at their edge, what do you do to pull your own head out of the water? Well, there's a lot that I could say. And I, the, I think the first thing that I want to say is that I th it's it's easy for me, I think, to sit here. I'm uh, 48 years old and I've lived a lot of life. And it's easy for me to, to, I think, sit here and make all of this sound very easy. It has not been easy. It's taken 48 years to build the mindset and look at the way things the way that I do. But to answer your question, I think the biggest key for me was intention. You know, I, I think that there were points in my life when I really made decisions about who I wanted to be, who I didn't want to be, and how I wanted to show up in this, how I wanted to show up in this world. And I think that once you know the answers to those things, you can, you can, work to be more and more intentional all the time to catch yourself and to notice when you're you're falling into a dark place and things like that it is a muscle that you have to build over time and to some of us it comes more naturally than others to some of us it it doesn't come naturally at all but i can say with with full certainty that um, I think for all of this, it's a, it's a muscle that we can build, but you do have to practice some awareness and some intention and really get clear on who you want to be and how you want to show up. And, you know, I, I want to say also, you, you mentioned um, in the context of, of loneliness, you mentioned suicide and I have experienced those thoughts, you know, I wrote in the book about being 13 years old and not wanting to be here anymore, you know, and it's one of the loneliest places you can be. And, um, you know, what I, what I would like to say is that if, if that is where you are, number one, please get help. But number two, the, one of the, I, I think, truest aspects of life is that life is always changing and people are coming in and out of our lives and circumstances are changing and you know don't get stuck in where you are today because i guarantee you that tomorrow is coming and with it come other possibilities Mindy, our time is almost ending but i want to i want to end on this note you also write this idea about recognizing the kinds of problems we create for ourselves. I mean, obviously you had nothing to do with creating the fact that you're uh, living your life in a wheelchair and have for the vast majority of your life and will likely for the remainder of your life. You've had a very fulfilling life. You have, uh, you're a mother and you're a spouse and you've had a great career academically and also professionally. Your book is gonna be on fire. Your podcast is growing significantly. Your influence as a keynote speaker you're available to keynote you know, companies and associations and conferences. Make sure you Google Mindy Henderson. Independent of the problems we don't create for ourselves, the traumas, the adversity, the things that are handed to us we cannot impact, how much of you think, how much of our problems do you think we create for ourselves that could be avoided with a better mindset, a proactive muscle, to quote you? Where does that fit in your own life around recognizing the problems you create for yourself? It's, it's a really good point. And, and I, I certainly do think that 
um, a lot of the problems that we create for ourselves are avoidable. Um, you know, it, just as easily as we can create a problem for ourselves, we can create something else for ourselves, you know, but again, I think it comes back to really knowing who you are and knowing who you want to show up as, because I think so often when we're creating problems for ourselves, it's because we're showing up as something, I don't want to say less than, but something, something that is, is not representative of who we really want to be in this world. And so I think the stronger hold you can have on yourself, who you are, who you're not, and live that every day, I think that's how we can potentially avoid as many problems for ourselves as we can. It's not to say that all problems are uh, that we create for ourselves are avoidable. Um, I think that, you know, the key is knowing that we can, again, learn from the challenges that we create for ourselves. I've certainly created problems for myself in the past, and I have learned from every single one of them. And I think that's one of the ways that you maybe don't go on to repeat a particular problem for yourself. So unlike the chapter on loneliness, uh, which I did not relate to, this one I fiercely related to. Because I can tell you, I think the vast majority, if not nearly all of the problems in my life, I created myself. Mm. The budget that I manage is, you know, over because I didn't set tighter parameters or I, or I you know, overindulged myself. Or there's conflict in a relationship because I didn't set boundaries or I overcommitted and underdelivered. Under or perhaps um, someone has violated an expectation of mine, but I didn't tell them what my expectation was. I didn't declare my intent. And so as I look at my life, I think the vast majority of my problems, perhaps fortunately or frustratingly, I did create myself, which means someone like me should in that case be able to avoid most of them by being clear, having high courage conversations, moving outside my comfort zone, declaring my intent, not saying things that might minimize or create conflict with others, but still set expectations. So that part of the chapter spoke to me tremendously around my how easy my life could become if I stopped creating problems for myself. I also think a lot of people are like me when they actually seek conflict. I think it's one of my areas of both uh, uh, of uh, strength and weakness. I think one of my strengths is I do seek conflict because I like to resolve things. I don't like lingering bad feelings or mismatched expectations. I also think mm -hmm. that I see conflict too often. Sometimes I have to have a villain or have to have, a, have an enemy. I hope that mm -hmm. doesn't describe me as a parent and a spouse, but I think if people are self-aware, they can relate to it. I learned so much from your book. It's on sale now. Mm -hmm. The truth about things that suck and how to make them suck less. Make sure that you pick up a copy, perhaps a copy for your team. What a great book for book clubs to read. You are an in-demand keynote speaker, motivational speaker. You speak a lot virtually and in person as well. Mindy Henderson, delighted to have you back for a second time on Leadership. It's an honor. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for joining us. And we'll see you back here next week for a new topic on leadership.